Nothing, this, this passage that you've read to us is proof that nothing is ever wasted on a writer. Mm. Because indeed, you write from experience. Well, that is one of the... You know, when you're writing a historical novel, there's a great leap of the imagination. Mm. And there's a lot of unknowns, you know. And um, I, I think what I try to do is try to put some things from real experience into a book. Either, you know, taking bits of certain characters, adding them into the characters in the book. or But that, that event, actually, that did happen to me um, when I was living in Portugal. Uh, I was on the phone to my mum in, in the post office and I was just idly looking out the window. And I saw this woman lying on the ground, two men standing over her. And um, they were just sort of standing there. And I thought, that's a bit odd. And, and then I realised there was something actually quite badly wrong with this woman. And a crowd started to gather. And I'd done a first aid course just before I left the UK. Uh, a three-day first aid course. And as part of work. And I thought, well, I sort of know what to do here, kind of. So I sort of ran out. And nobody was doing anything. And so I, I did pretty much what I described there. I sort of did all the examinations and they were all, go, they were all going, O oh, signore, un dottore? And I was going, no, 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 I'm not a doctor. <laughs> but nobody would touch her. And I was going, so I, you know, checked her and eventually realised, oh my God, there's something in her throat and I've got to put my hand in her mouth. And did that, put my hand in her mouth and I was feeling around and I could feel this thing in the back of her throat and she was, an, you know, an old lady and she looked dead by that point, pretty much. And I pulled these teeth out as it transpired, literally pulled them out. The crowd went, ugh, like that, <laughs> all sort of backing off like there were extras in a bad film. <laughs> and I'm sort of there with these teeth holding them up and the woman started breathing again and the wee lady came running out of the post office because I was going, can you take the teeth from me? Somebody in the room going, no, no. The wee lady came running out of the post office with an envelope with a, with a window in it. That was the great thing. It was one of those window envelopes. So I put the teeth in the window envelope and put it in her... And the first thing she wanted to know was where, where was her bag? Where was her bag? And then the ambulance finally arrived and it was only... Uh, later, when I went to work and explained to my boss, because I was teaching in a language school, when I explained what had happened, after he said, why didn't she just breathe through her nose? <laughs> <laughs> um, he then said, uh, oh, well, you see, in Portugal, if you intervene in a circumstance like that, then you can, and the person dies, you can be sued. And that is why nobody else was helping her, because they didn't want to be sued. So she would have, you know, she would have died. Um, because the ambulance would have come too late, I think. Um, and yes, I, I don't know her name, and she sort of regally waved as she got into the ambulance like that. <laughs> so, did, did you file it away and think I'll use this somehow in a short story? Or at the time, no, I didn't. I just, I was too, I was quite pumped up about having done it, and um, quite sort of proud of myself. Uh, but I'd really only just started writing at that point, so. I wasn't really thinking in that way. I don't think I hadn't really, you know, put together that what I did was write stories or... Because I'd only, mm. I'd literally only really just begun mm. there, mm. Mm. writing. You said that you often... Because you're setting... You're, both novels are set in the 19th century and you can, you can obviously research things, but to, make, to use some, a story like that makes it give, gives you, grounds you, I suppose, in some respect. But the other things that you use are, of course, in Gillespie and I, is the great love of Glasgow. Mm. And the, the sense of place is wonderful. Now, I know that you did a lot of research mm. about the house that the Gillespies live in, for instance, mm, mm. In, and the street is still there. And I, yeah. do, I think it's called Balliol, Balliol Street, street now, isn't, yes, it? Yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so um, I don't quite know why I picked that street. Um, I think it's partly to do with the architecture of the flats on the top. Um, on the top story, it's quite a unique architecture for Glasgow because most flats in Glasgow only have one story but these ones in um, Balliol Street they're sort of late Georgian as opposed to Victorian and they actually have a wee attic so there's a whole load of wee attic rooms up a sort of wee attic -y staircase and I as a student had been to a party in a house like this and I always thought oh my god stairs in a flat what so um so I remembered that and I thought yes and it's quite a 
quite a characteristic street and I had lived just around the corner from there as a student um, in Carnarvon Street, uh, not realising at the time that it was the red light district. Um, me and my flatmate used to sit at the window drying our hair <laughs> in the summer and wonder why these women were giving us daggers across the street, <laughs> like, you know, get off our pitch, you know, in, in the early 80s. Um, so I knew that area quite well. And then when it came to um, setting it there, I decided I had to have another look inside one of those flats. So I, I wrote letters to everybody in the street saying, I'm an author, can I come and look at your house? And most people just completely ignored me. But there were one or two brave souls who said, yeah, yeah, come and have a wee look. So I ended up um, going into this one amazing flat. They're amazing. They've got these beautiful Georgian windows. And I think it had belonged to Phil Kay, the comedian, at one point. And he'd, he'd opened it up somehow, made it all sort of one big through room. It was amazing. Um, and the, the family that lived there very kindly let me kind of poke around and take photographs and... So I really use that because I'm very driven by images. You know, I look at a lot of maps, mm. contemporary maps, paintings, obviously, for Gillespie and I, um, uh, pictures, photographs. Um, I just spend endless hours doing that, uh, probably too long. And that's why it takes me so long to write books. And as you mentioned, Harriet is in her eight, is, is almost 80 years old when she's uh, this very unreliable narrator telling us this story. Um, but she is in a flat in Bloomsbury, mm. which she shares with two goldfinches. Mm. And um, she has a helper who she is very um, distrustful of. Mm. I think we could say. Mm. Um, but that you, you actually lived in the set, that area, didn't you? That's and, right, as yes. As a student? Um, so that was, again, something that rooted in fact for you. That's right, yes. Uh, I didn't realise at the time how lucky I was, but when I, was at, I went to drama school in London and uh, one of my fellow students, her family were quite wealthy and they owned this flat in Bloomsbury. And, you know, I knew nothing then, came down from Glasgow, wet behind the ears. I thought, oh, yeah, it's dead normal just to own a flat in Bloomsbury. <laughs> and, and I spent the summer, I lived there for a whole summer in this flat. And um, when it came to, to writing this book, I went and I got, um, they're actually, they're sort of mansions. And I, I looked online for estate agents who were selling flats in that, in those blocks and got the, the plans of the layout and figured out where, you know, where Harriet's room was and where the assistant's room was. And, you know, I, I, I sort of have to inhabit it in that way. Otherwise, <clears throat> I don't know, it, doesn't, it kind of doesn't come to life for me unless I really kind of go into it in that much detail. Because you had to work out whether, it, looking at the floor plan, whether it, if you were standing at one door, what you could see. Whether you could see what the piano or not. Yeah, 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 that, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right, yeah. Now, you're thinking we're never going to get around to this novel, and we will, but um, Gillespie and I is a very, very difficult book to talk about. And therefore, Jane did hardly any interviews when it came out. And um, the thing is, you, you, you must not give away things in it because nothing is as it seems in it. However, the one thing we have established from your reading is how very different these two voices are. 15-year-old um, Bessie, who mm. is bawdy and bravura, and Harriet, who is incredibly proper mm. and a pedant, I would say. Yeah. The, was it a conscious thing to to go for such very different voices? I think partly yes. I think having done Bessie, who has practically no punctuation, can't really construct a sentence, um, can seem callow um, and, and and possibly not very bright, but she actually is quite she bright. Is. Um, having done that, I thought yes, I'll do. You know, and I based that voice on. Um, you know, I've, my family come from Ireland originally. Um, my mum, my, my aunt, um, a woman that I actually met in Durham prison who was not an, an IRA prisoner, I should say. She was, she was simply, she uh, had her husband killed. Um, uh, <laughs> as, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> but fascinating character. And, you know, if, if, any, if there's anybody's voice that's her, that Bessie is closest to, it would be, it would be that person. Um, and then in doing Gillespie and I, I think I did want a different challenge and I thought, well, I'll have someone who's very highly educated English, 
pedantic use of commas, like in, 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 in the observations there's hardly any punctuation. Gillespie and I, there's too many bits of punctuation because she's so pedantic in the way she writes. And, um, and I suppose I slightly based um, the character of ha well, one of the inspirations, she comes from a few places, but one was um, my husband's grandmother, who was the wife of a diplomat and was an incredibly proper lady, very posh, and is now dead. But um, and she's one of those people who isn't she very? She had a very girlish little voice like that, but but she could say incredibly cruel things in that voice, so that you wouldn't quite know that she would, you know, she was being mean, and so she would say things to me like. Oh, darling, I do hope that one day you'll be as successful as your husband. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, other great quotes, like we just moved into a flat. She'd go, oh, darling, do you, darlings, do you have a lovely view? Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> one doesn't need a view when one has a life of the imagination. <laughs> um, and, and my favourite was, cause she, and she would always do it when there was no one in the room, she would go... Um, to me, she said, oh, darling, would you change my, my duvet for me? I can't do it anymore. So I was changing your duvet, and she said, darling, you do that so well. You do it almost as though you were born to it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, just brilliant, brilliant um, character. And, and I think in my first draft of Gillespie and I, I, I had very much her in my head. I had to pull back from that and... and, and put a bit more Joan Greenwood in to sort of make her, because, um, you know, she is a charming person, Harriet. Uh, she, she can be judgmental, but she, she also has to be charming, so I, I had to pull that back a bit. A lot of, review, a, a lot of the reviews say she's not likeable. Um, I actually like her very much. Um, I think it, because really, um, from, I think, it is a wonderful portrait of a very, very lonely woman. Mm. A woman also born out of her time mm -hmm. in that um, we, we see the, the horrors of Victorian spinsterhood mm -hmm. in her. Um, it, but did you, did you really set out with that? The, the thing about writing about the past is that you can approach it from a post-Freudian point of view, if you like. So the psychology of her is very interesting. Mm. And did you do a lot of research on that sort of area? Um, do you know what? I think it, it comes from a more instinctive place in that... I meant women's lives as well. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Way. Well, you know, I, I researched a lot about women's lives in Glasgow at that time. Um, which was quite interesting. Um, and I'm not going to be able to remem remember the names of any of the books or authors because it was so long ago, but I, I did research mm. that. Mm. Um, and also, you know, I think it is, there is a loneliness in it, and I think partly that came from... I'd, I'd just been... I'd spent a long time writing the observations, and that's, you know, it's a lonely thing, writing mm. a book. Mm. And I had to start... My, I was advised to start my new book before the observations came out because they said you'll get too distracted by readings and this and that and the other. So I immediately leapt into another book. And, um, you know, I'd spent a long time on my own, in my pyjamas, in a room, just, you know, writing away. And it, it's quite a lonely thing. And I think that bled into, um, you know, Gillespie and I, I really do. People often... I mean, I'm, I'm glad you say that you like her because I like her and I feel sorry for her and I um you know I I sometimes think about you know myself if I'd been mm -hmm. a woman at that time and and how I'd, I think I would have been you know I would probably have been put in a lunatic asylum really because I just don't think I could have coped with the the restrictions that mm -hmm. were put on women so mm -hmm. you know I think she finds outlets for her creativity you know she does a bit of dabbling and painting and, and other mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. um but you know uh i think her life was probably a very restricting one despite the fact that she actually had a bit of money mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. so